Good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you're located. My name is Ann Greiner and I'm president and CEO of the Primary Care Collaborative. For those of you who may not know the PCC, we are a multi-stakeholder, nonpartisan membership organization that focuses on improving the nation's health and reducing inequities by strengthening primary care. I'm delighted for this conversation this afternoon. We are welcoming CDC Director, Dr. Mandy Cohen for a conversation with Mark Del Monte, who's President and CEO of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We'll be exploring the whole issue of how primary care can enhance trust and uptake of vaccines. And we'll be focusing in particular on children and adolescents. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. All of our webinars are recorded and we make that recording available on our website, the pcc.org in uh, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, due to the uh, limited time that we have with um, Dr. Cohen, we will not be taking questions during the conversation that she's having uh, with Mark Del Monte. Immediately following, there will be a reactor panel and we will take questions during that period. So put them into your chat. Uh, without further ado, let me uh, welcome Mark Del Monte. He's, as I said, CEO of the American Academy of Pediatrics where he serves 67,000 pediatric physicians and other clinicians. He's also chair of PCC's board of directors. Over to you, Mark. Uh, thank you so much, Anne. I am absolutely delighted to be here today, and I get to have the honor of introducing Dr. Mandy Cohen, who is the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is, of course, focused on disease control and prevention, but also environmental health, health promotion, and education activities to improve the health of Americans and others around the world. Uh, Dr. Cohen is an internal medicine physician and led the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, where she was lauded for her outstanding leadership during the COVID crisis. She also transformed the North Carolina Medicaid program through the state's Medicaid expansion and her focus on whole person health. Prior to joining CDC, Dr. Cohen served as executive vice president at Allidade and CEO of Allidade Care Solution. Welcome, Dr. Cohen. We're thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. Yeah, Thanks for inviting me. You. Really great. Let's begin at the beginning and just reflect a little bit on the role of vaccines in preventing infectious diseases, uh, of course, uh, focusing on children and adolescents a bit. Uh, I think by any measure, we can point to the development of vaccines and the implementation of routine immunization policies as incredible public health successes. So what do you think are the most compelling stories of how vaccines have protected health and improved lives? And where does vaccination fall in your priorities as director of the CDC? Well, Mark, it's great to be here again. And thank you so much um, for your leadership and the partnership with um, American Academy of Pediatricians and Pediatricians across the country, because the, the mission to protect health and improve lives uh, is, is a team sport. And I'm so grateful to have such amazing team members. And that's what we're going to focus on today. We have a real powerful tool in vaccines, um, but vaccines are are no good if they sit on a shelf, <laughs> right? They're not powerful if they're sitting on a shelf and they need both the care and thoughtful conversation as well as the administration to make sure those vaccines are getting to folks. But vaccines are such a critical component to our overall strategy to protect health and improve lives. I'm lucky enough to um, be a physician that has never seen a case of polio. And that's because since 1988, we've present, prevented 20 million cases of paralysis. Um, and so, I, I, you know, it's almost unfathomable to think about those kinds of numbers and what what the alternate reality would be if we didn't have those vaccines. But we're grateful that we have those tools. And the good news is, is like the vast majority of folks are continuing to get their children routinely vaccinated. We do have some work to do and we're going to get into that. 
Um, but we also have to make sure we're keeping up with those um, annual vaccines as well. Flu shots, COVID vaccines, RSV immunizations. And, um, so a lot of work to do, but there's a really important program that's been running for 30 years. We're about to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Vaccines for Children's program. Um, it is a program that um, provides vaccines to more than half of the children in the country. There were more than 70 million doses um, that were given just last year through that program. And so we have 24,000 private providers. Thank you all who are BSC providers, many, many, many of our, our pediatricians out there, and then 13,000 public sector sites like our fairly qualified health centers. Um, what a huge team effort um, to administer that program. And if you're not part of Vaccines for Children, we're making it even easier to be part of that, to make sure that you can be purchasing vaccines through that program and allowing them to be free um, for folks um, who, who qualify across the country. Oh, well, thank you for mentioning the Vaccines for Children's program. It is a hugely important part of the immunization system in the United States. And so I think that that's a great thing to lift up as we get started here. And also the notion that so many physicians practicing today haven't seen uh, vaccine preventable illnesses uh, is is just kind of a, a evidence of the the power of immunizations. Um, and you mentioned the distinction between annual vaccines versus routine immunizations. Let's stick with that for a second, if we might. How do you make the case for the critical role of routine immunizations uh, for vaccine preventable diseases like measles, alongside the importance of annual vaccines like flu and COVID, uh, and and that distinction? Well, one, I my, most of the time want to make sure folks know that we continue to see very high rates of those routine um, uh, immunizations, things like the measles, polio, chickenpox viruses, and those, th so that's great. Um, and we want to keep confidence in those vaccines incredibly high. Um, as a country, we see about 93% of entering kindergartners are up to date on those vaccines. We took a dip during COVID, understandably, folks weren't in their normal routines. We've mostly ca caught back up. We've been working really hard to catch up. Um, and CDC has been supporting a lot of that effort. And I, again, I know that is a something pediatricians have been really, really focused on. So thank you um, for that. Um, so we're, we're doing well. However, there are pockets in the country where we are seeing less. And I think it's just really important for you to know what's happening in your community. Um, and the most important thing that we see over and over again, whether it's on the routine vaccines or the annual, is that conversation with your doctor is the most influential thing that's going to decide whether or not you're going to, to get that vaccine, whether it's for your children um, or for yourself, having that conversation, making it easy um, for folks to, to do that is so important. So we know that we wanna maintain that confidence in routine vaccines. And for annual, look, these are newer, particularly as we think about COVID uh, vaccines. These are newer, people have questions. I, I encourage questions because that allows you to start a dialogue. Um, and uh, and making sure that we're both compensating folks for their time of administering, but also talking about these. Um, and we worked really hard to make sure that that was possible. And so we want folks to ask questions um, and, and go to the folks they trust, their pediatricians, their doctors, um, and um, making sure that, that folks know how important it is to uh, defend themselves against these viruses. For sure. I think part of that enabling that conversation is getting access to care. And so I think we're uh, seeing a, a number of challenges to that now, and, and especially the growing number of children and adolescents who are uh, challenged to get a regular source of care. That number in the last 10 years or so is increasing, and um, we're worried about that. You know, a, a number of somewhere around 14% of children, we think, don't have a usual source of care. And this has been a particular focus for you. You've written about the importance of public health and healthcare integration. How can CDC, public health, other federal agencies, how can we all work together to address these access gaps and integrate public health and healthcare even more closely? Yeah, these are um, really important. I think 
we going through the COVID pandemic, I think really brought home how important it is for us to be one team as we're protecting health. We can't have public health sitting separate from, from where our, our pediatricians are in terms of protecting our children. Um, but we also know there are other partners in, in this space, like our educators, right? Where are our kids and our families most of the time? It's in school. And so how do we think about all of the settings where our families are and make sure that we're working together um, as one team? But you can't solve problems you don't see and that you don't see together. So right, I'm a data, I'm a data gal, and so right, making sure we have that right data. As I said, there there are pockets here in the, in across the country where there are lower immunizations, and having that knowledge, I think, spurs action. Right, it can allow you to be really focused to say, okay, it's this community, this zip code. What are those access problems? How do we come together as a community? Because I don't think public health can solve it alone, nor can pediatricians, nor can education. Right, but collectively we can solve that problem. Um, and But we have to make sure we're involving our elected officials as well, like reminding them about, about the ongoing challenges of, of access, um, making sure that they know how important continuing to preserve programs like the Vaccines for Children's program is. Um, it's why I'm on the road doing that. I was just in Michigan uh, last week, uh, kicking off a back to school effort uh, that we are doing to remind folks about vaccine. And I was there with the mayor of, of Detroit, right? Because this is about making sure that our elected officials, as well as those doing the work on the ground, are, are really coordinated and can solve problems together. No, I think that's really important too, about uh, when we fan out in that way, then there's no missed opportunities. So that whenever, wherever a child is accessing care, there is an opportunity for an immunization there, whether it's a whether it's family physicians, pediatricians, public health, nurse practitioners, wherever school-based health center, wherever right. that child is accessing care, there's an opportunity for a vaccination in that space. I think that's such a crucially important. Exactly. Uh, I think access is a key piece of it, but there are other there are other challenges that we have to talk about. Unfortunately, I think the um, the topic of misinformation and disinformation is something that I think is on all of our minds uh, these days, uh, particularly as it relates to vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. These things contribute to mistrust, uh, contribute to mistrust in public health, contribute to mistrust of the government and government agencies that are responsible for uh, public health and for federal programs, uh, contribute to mistrust of of physicians and the healthcare system. Uh, I think we see the consequences in the clinical setting, certainly, um, but we also see it play out in public policy where, where politicians and others sort of are receiving this, uh, repeating it and questioning the role of school entry requirements, for example. And uh, how, how can we work together? How can we work together really effectively to combat vaccine misinformation uh, and the purveyors of disinformation and really strengthen confidence in the vaccine system? Yeah, this is a really challenging issue and it's not, there's no one thing to do. It's going to be many things together, but importantly, I want um, our pediatricians and other primary care docs that are, are tuning in to know that they continue to be the most trusted source of information. Um, our nurse practitioners, our nurses, our pharmacists all continue to be really important sources of information. And we want to make sure you're armed with as much good information. So when misinformation that someone says, I, I saw this or I saw that, um, that you are ready um, to be able to answer questions and give folks the, the um, right information. And so our strategy really is about accurate information very timely, easy to understand, engaging, right? We have to remember that too. Look, everyone's getting their information in very different ways, right? It's all in a form of entertainment, well, entertaining as well. Um, so how do we think about um, timely, fast, accurate, but flood the zone? It's also a lot of it, right? You can't just say it once and like think that you're done, right? This is repetitive um, uh, sharing of information. And that's where CDC wants to be a great partner. You don't have to do this alone in your practice. You are busy. Let we, we have created those resources that you can use over and over and over, right? There's so many things that um, you can do in terms of uh, answering simple questions. We have things for different kinds of audiences, of course, every language, um, but making sure that, again, it's repetitive um, and that it can be as engaging as, as it, it possibly can. Yeah. 
think that's, I think the first thing when you first, uh, the answer to the first question too, is that, uh, that most clinicians uh, who are uh, immunizing kids welcome questions uh, about vaccines or anything else about their child's health. That is a normal part of, of providing care to children. It's combating this sort of really challenging mis and disinformation that flows out there where we need different tools. And I, I like that notion of flood the zone. I think that is a really uh, a, a ways in which people are receiving information, a social media friendly and yeah. all of that. I think it's really yeah. important. Um, and it creates, uh, it creates confidence. And, uh, and folks things. should know that CDC, it, yeah. Sure. Oops, sorry, I just, I talked over you. You got ahead. I, no, I, please, you, I apologize. You're, I was, you're the boss. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. I, no, no, uh, that was an internet glitch. But I was going to say, I, I want folks to know that we are actually studying this and trying to understand it. There are many researchers who are doing this. So we want to get even more and more targeted on strategies. But um, I think we we know how to, to do this. But it, it's going to take all of us sharing good information over and over in an engaging way um, in order to um, overcome some of the misinformation. Um, and I love... Mark, that you were saying is, is like make that your practice a place of of asking questions, um, right? Because that starts that that dialogue. Um, so it's wonderful. Yeah, I think that's I think that is so important. Um, you know, uh, you know, your child is the most important thing to you, and the idea that you would ask about any prescription, any intervention, any medical care is a normal and and wonderful thing for parents to be doing, uh, and and that's that includes vaccines, and so that that is a good thing. I think it's this environment of all of this that that is swirling around that we have to combat as leaders in medicine, leaders in public health, uh, leaders uh, in in trying to uh, combat all this environmental stuff that they're also being inundated with. And I think that's exactly right. Um, it, it is, uh, it, it, it's that environment, I think, that leads to the next sort of conversation about where vaccines became so pervasive to talk about, and that was COVID, right? Where there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm when the COVID vaccine was developed. And we know it played a huge role in preventing morbidity and mortality, death and disease, uh, and and people um, learned about vaccine development in a way that was kind of <laughs> front row seat. That, that this was usually the province of people who just were thinking about the you know the idea that everybody knows what ACIP is now is kind of a fascinating <laughs> thing. To people, you know, uh, we just knew about that before COVID. Uh, we were kind of nerdy about it and, and uh, thought that was fun. But I wonder if you know this far out and you know, with some time and a reflection, what lessons do you think we can take away in public health and healthcare? Uh, from the pandemic and how do we apply that to other parts of the system now? Absolutely. We all learned so much during COVID and um, our, our world is different uh, in 2024 than it was just a few years ago. And so we have to all, whether we're in public health or in health delivery side of things, like we have to be different. Um, the expectations are different and they, and in, in a wonderful way. And I think folks have understood the power and necessity of public health to protect us all. Um, but but we we also had, had a lot of things where we could do better. And I think particularly getting data out faster in a clear and effective way was a huge takeaway. Um, so making sure that you're communicating in a clear way. And I hope you are seeing that from CDC. We put a lot of effort into communicating a lot more clearly, a lot more quickly. Um, we, we completely redid our web presence. So if you want to find things on cdc.gov, it's so much easier now. We archive 60% of it. Um, so we want to get out that good scientific data faster to folks so that they can be making good common sense decisions for their family. So that means it has, it's not just for public health professionals, it's for, this is information for all of us to be able to protect our families. Um, I, I think the other is about partnership, going back to this team sport. Um, this, you know, making sure that we are doing this cannot be done from public health alone. This is why I thank you um, to Mark and to PCC for inviting me here because this has to be collaborative effort. It had for a long time, but I think we've all gotten a real uh, a lesson in the importance of ongoing, really thoughtful partnership. I think the other, as I, I just want to admit, I'm a bit of a, an operations person, right? Making things work. Um, and you have to think not just about the message, 
but making sure the vaccine is where it's supposed to be, when it's supposed to be there at, at a, a cost that folks can, can uh, afford, right, and access points, and making sure all the operations work. So I think we've also learned about how do we prepare well for something like that to happen, right? So right now, great time to start ordering your, you know, pre-ordering your flu shot and your, your, your COVID vaccines, because I want y'all to have them in your, in your office as soon as they're available, but right? that means pre-work preparation, right? Right now that we could be doing. So I think these are all um, lessons we uh, continue to learn together. Um, we are certainly implementing our version of better communication, better partnership, better operations. Um, but I think that's all of us um, learn those kinds of lessons. And I appreciate everyone meeting this new moment of things, uh, you know, that the world is different. And so we all have to operate a bit differently. That's great, yeah, just right. And I think now that we sort of have this this knowledge of pandemics and 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 infectious diseases in a different way, people are thinking about future uh, infectious diseases differently. So now we hear things like avian influenza, and we wonder what that means and what's going to happen. And so um, uh, bird flu uh, that, that yeah. becomes a headline in the newspaper, and everyone wonders mm -hmm. oh, what does this mean? Uh, is it in humans? And all of a sudden, people are trying to figure out the risk of all this. Um, you know, how concerned should we be about avian influenza? And and from a primary care perspective, what should we be thinking in terms of both thinking about children and adolescents, but also adults? And 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 how should primary care be be uh, responding at this point? Yeah, great question. Um, right now, the risk to the general population for bird flu or avian flu is is low. However. We are taking it very seriously because of the first time we saw avian flu move to cows. Um, and that is a, 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 a new vector, a new place for this virus to start spreading and interact with humans, right? Um, and so we interact with cows in two ways, right? The farm workers, but also through the milk. Good news is pasteurization works in terms of keeping the milk safe, but but what we are seeing is the farm workers themselves are the ones who um, continue to have risk when they are in contact with those cows. So the general public right now, risk is low. That being said, we've all learned again, another lesson from COVID, these viruses love to change. So that's what I could tell you today, August 2nd is, Risk is low, but we have to do hard work and preparation now, one, to stop this virus from changing because we've never seen it spread human to human. However, it has made people incredibly sick and, and die. It is, it is, it is um, a very worrisome virus if you, if you ca uh, catch it, but right now it is never spread from one human to the next. However, we know viruses change and we're trying to make sure that doesn't happen. So we have to track the virus, make sure it's not mutating or changing. And then second, we have to be ready if there is something that would change in a virus because we know, look, uh, the, that that is a possibility. So unlike in COVID, we've been tracking avian flu for many, many years. So we have tests that can pick up avian flu right now, and we're expanding our testing capacity. We have treatment, Tamiflu, um, which is the same uh, that we use for seasonal flu. Um, and we have vaccine candidates. And again, these are vaccines that are different from the seasonal annual flu shot, um, but they would be ones that would be tailored to the the kind of virus that we see circulating. And we have manufacturing capacity that we didn't have uh, before COVID. So we're in a very different place, but for, I would say from a day-to-day -day pediatrician, you know, general population perspective, that is not a thing you need to worry about. We in public health are spending a lot of time on it to make sure you don't have to worry. Um, but I will say we want to do a good job of getting a flu shot this year because we don't want to see both avian and seasonal flu happening at the same time. So we know we have a vaccine for that. We already know it's so important for our kids to get their seasonal flu uh, vaccine this fall and get an updated COVID vaccine. We'll get into more of that, but that's where, where I think everyone should keep their focus. Great. Perfect. Yeah, that's a perfect segue because I did want to ask you about the viral respiratory season coming up in uh, this fall and winter. Uh, it, it is coming. And uh, and so how should we be thinking about uh, primary care and flu, COVID, RSV 
and um, all of that that um, that is coming around the corner. And uh, uh, we know we've got uh, new immunizations to think about this year. And so uh, what's your best advice for us? Sure. Well, first rem reminder, right, for, for flu does impact our 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 kiddos uh, now again order your updated flu shots order your updated covid shots order your um, rsv immunizations um, it's great that we have these tools we need to use them so order now um, and then also think about your your own practice operations when do folks get asked about it how do they get um, uh, how does that work into the practice flow? Um, who's administering those? Um, and making sure that at every visit, um, there's an opportunity to have that dialogue or have that administration happen. And so how do you build that in in a seamless seamless way? And that takes some work ahead of time, again, that preparation. Um, the other thing I wanted to make sure beyond vaccine, just to put on everyone's radar, is, is about treatment. Um, again, we, we have treatment um, for flu, we have treatment for COVID, um, and for certain high risk, you know, you know, for folks, that is the right thing, um, is to think about treatment. And so making sure that we are offering particularly um, our older adults, pregnant moms, um, folks who are immunocompromised, treatment is also important. So I just wanted to put a plug in, in there. We all have known for many years about the impact of flu on our kids. What we're seeing in our COVID data as well, we continue to see kids get very sick, particularly young, young kids, even who don't have underlying conditions from COVID. So it's starting to seem like we are seeing similar, not exactly the same, but similar kinds of patterns with COVID that we see with flu, meaning our youngest kids um, be impacted um, by COVID. So we really want to make sure that we are getting them their first series of that COVID vaccine um, as, as well. So COVID and, and, and flu. And then with RSV, again, we, we've worked really hard to make sure this RSV season that we're going to have the supply of the uh, immunization that is needed uh, for all of our families. So again, something new to work into conversations with, with your families about how they can protect their babies from RSV. That, that is um, a really exciting tool that we need to, to use more this year. Yeah, it is really exciting. Uh, that is a very exciting tool. And so we, we look forward to a robust uh, implementation of that this year uh, for sure. Uh, and that and that leads me to a, a question that was an important innovation for RSV. And so uh, let's keep innovating. Uh, what, what do you see on the horizon? What excites you about opportunities for innovation in the immunization space uh, for children and adolescents? And and how can we be ready for that in, in primary care and in the healthcare system and in public health? What, what are you excited about? Well, you know, there are a lot of vaccines in the pipeline. I know, you know, in the very near term, we're looking to simplify some recommendations related to meningococcal vaccines for our preteens and adolescents and make recommendations more simple. So that's great. Simplification right. is good. There's there's vaccines in the pipeline, but I think this is going to, um, we're need, going to need to manage vaccine fatigue um, in our patients and thinking about how to space things out or how to, how to group things together. So um, that it's uh, another, but they're so powerful. Um, and so, you know, making sure we get that opportunity. I think there's, you know, back to my my operational hat, right? Making sure that also that we have good data understanding as we have all of these vaccines, tracking them well, knowing when folks got them, understanding where there might be gaps and allowing us to do that focused outreach. I think we have a lot more work to do and we are trying to do some of that work uh, starting at, at CDC and on the public health side, but that is always gonna be a collaboration between your electronic health record um, and registries on, on the vaccine side. Um, so those are the kinds of innovations, like how do we all overcome vaccine fatigue? as new vaccines come out, how do we simplify uh, even more? Uh, and then how do we think about using data? And of course, all of the, the work on communications and misinformation. Oh, wonderful. Uh, well, we're at time. And so the, the Primary Care Collaborative is a, is a large membership collaborative across multi-stakeholders, all committed to primary care. We want to be useful to you. And so let me just give you the last word. How can the Primary Care Collaborative help you and uh, with your uh, job of vaccinating the country? Well, first, thank you. Um, I just want to say 
thank you for the for the work, but it does take preparation. And this is why we're doing this on August, uh, you know, in August ahead of uh, winter virus season, ahead of back to school. This is the exact right time. Make sure you are thinking about uh, catching folks up on routine vaccines, uh, having those conversations, pre-ordering or order ordering your vaccine so they're ready to go um, and baking it into your workflow. We have a lot of tools now at CDC. We have, we've done a lot of work on messages that work. What are those key messages that can be simplified that people understand? So really utilize um, the resources that we've put together on how to have hard conversations. What are those right, right words that um, seem to, to resonate um, with, with folks so you don't have to start from scratch. So pre-order, prepare, work things into your workflow and communications, and just know that we're trying to do everything we can on the CDC side to be great partners. So if there are things you see, use collaboratives like PCC, like American Academy of Pediatrician, raise good ideas to us, because if you have great ideas and things we're missing, we want to uh, we want to adjust so that we can, uh, you know, I think we all have a shared goal of protecting health and improving lives for all of our community. Um, and I'm just grateful to uh, be part of that team uh, and for, for your support of that mission. Thank you so much. We're so lucky to have you at CDC. Really so much. Thank you for this and uh, have a great weekend. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. That was great. Uh, now we get to have a little reaction panel here uh, for the rest of our time together. I get to welcome our excellent uh, experts who will give their thoughts about what they just heard from the conversation with the director. So first up is Dr. Lon Ray Falusi, a pediatrician at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. She serves as medical director of advocacy and education for the Child Health Advocacy Institute. In that role, Dr. Falusi develops community-based curricula for trainees and faculty and researches the health outcomes of governmental policies. And also Lisa Robertson, who has spent the last 11 years as the executive director of the Indiana Immunization Coalition, in addition to the coalition's work in advocacy, education, and partnerships. Over the last four years, the coalition has administered over 127,800 vaccines. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So Lonre and Lisa, thank you for joining this conversation. I appreciate that so much. Let's just begin with some reactions. I'll just open it up to you and let you um, respond. Uh, Lonre, do you want to kick us off? Sure. So first, thank you so much, uh, Mark, to the PCC for this invitation. It's really quite a pleasure to be here. Um, first, I'll say about Dr. Cohen's uh, discussion. I really appreciate that she uplifted the Vaccines for Children program. I've worked at a federally qualified health center. I currently work at an academic center. We just could not do this important work of preventing illness without the VFC program. So I can't believe it's 30 years old. Um, it's amazing that it's been around supporting families for that long. So thanks to her for highlighting that. Um, I also want to upl uplift something else that she said, um, which is that I completely agree that as a pediatrician that we, other healthcare professionals, we really do welcome questions from patients and from our community members when it comes to vaccines. We exist for this. We want to be a resource for parents and a resource for their questions um, and, and being clear that we are all on the same page when it comes to the health of their children. Thanks so much. Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. So I, I was thinking about Dr. Cohen's talking about, you know, preparedness and being prepared for all of the vaccinations, but for our upcoming respiratory season. So I think another part of, of being prepared is also doing pre-education. And so making sure, you know, when we're seeing patients now or even, you know, a month or two ago, we're reminding them, like, don't forget, like, thank you for coming in for your routine vaccines, but you're going to need your annual vaccines come this fall. So here are the ones to be thinking about so that they're not surprised or caught unaware when they come back and they're like, oh, I, I didn't realize I needed my COVID and flu and RSV. So doing that kind of pre-work with patients as well. And, you know, I kind of think about that with our patients that are eight, you know, our little ones that are getting ready to turn nine and, and telling parents, so next time we see you, we're gonna be offering the HPV vaccine. This is what it's for. Please think about it before we see you the next time. So doing that pre-work, I think also helps parents and, and patients prepare for their next visit. Same. 
Yeah, I was also thrilled to see her um, talk both about the system itself and how the vaccines for children work, but also the, um, the how the system works. You actually have to, you have to prepare, get ready, do the ordering, get yourself ready so that when you have those opportunities for a vaccination, when the child is there, when the family is ready, that you don't miss any. You know, I think that was a really important key point. She also uh, sort of leaned into the threats. She called them dips in uh, vaccinations and uh, what are the sources of that um, fragmentation of care, misinformation and disinformation contributing to sort of overall uh, trust issues. And so I'm curious about your perspective on those threats that we have to the, to the uh, vaccination uh, system and to opportunities for vaccination and how do you address them in in, in the at the community level uh, but um, and then for you also um, Lonray in, in your practice so Lisa how do you think about those at the community level and and what are you all doing yeah thank you we think about this a lot uh, misinformation and mistrust um, our population is primarily um, underserved under vaccinated low income and so we have to think about this a lot about vaccine equity and disparities. And, and so I think working to be a trusted partner in the community, we've been around for 21 years, but in direct service for only four. And so making sure that, that we have the right trusted messenger, right? I'm not the right person to go into some of these communities and talk about vaccines and, and safety and efficacy, but I can find the right person to go into these communities and talk about vaccines. So making sure we have the right messenger, we're in the right location. So it can't be in our brick and mortar building from nine to five, Monday through Friday, that doesn't work. And so making sure we're, we're going out into the community to the churches and the schools and you know all of those locations, being there at the right time again. So being there in the evenings, we do shift work. So we may have um, a, a warehouse or manufacturing where we'll go in and do a clinic at seven in the morning because that's when shift changes. So really thinking about you know where, where you're providing services, um, that's a great way to build trust. And then also I think being, you know, being the voice and role model. So I think the most powerful thing I can say when I'm talking to someone is I got my vaccine, I vaccinated my kiddos, you know, my parents are vaccinated and being able to share that that I believe in this, I do it in my own personal life. It's not just something I do at work. It's a really important message. Thank you for that. I, I, that, I hadn't heard that before, but a uh, shift change. Like when that, <laughs> so being there when they're there, I think that is so clever. Uh, that's, that's really smart. Uh, Laundry. Yeah, thank you. I would wholeheartedly agree that these are major concerns when it comes to misinformation, disinformation, distrust. We do see this in patients that we care for in our office. And, you know, families are just trying to do their best, right? Learning more about vaccine safety and timing and side effects and they're going online and it's not always very easy to know what sources are credible and which are not. And I find that this leads to a lot of confusion for families. And unfortunately, sometimes that leads to decisions to skip certain vaccines or not vaccinate at all. Um, but to your question, and thankfully uh, we can address this in primary care and Dr. Cohen brought that up as well. Um, and just as an example, I recently saw a newborn for his first pediatrician visit um, and his mom shared with me and the pediatric resident who was working with me that she declined the hepatitis B vaccine at the hospital where the baby was born. And this is standard, right? We give the vaccine um, to babies at the birth hospital that that's the best time to give it to really reduce the risk of hepatitis B and liver cancer that can come, you know, later on in life due to um, if you catch the virus. Um, and she'd heard all of this, but she still declined the vaccine because she had a lot of questions and she wanted to wait till she was being seen at the medical home with us um, to get those questions answered. And I really do think that that's part of the strength of primary care. You know, we've already built these relationships with families. Um, and together we were able to, you know, hear out this mom's concerns about safety, um, you know, about she was being a black woman as she was and knowing the history of racism in medical trials. And, you know, I could tell her I empath empathize with that. We've, we've studied that. We know that unfortunate history um, about the side effects. Eventually she agreed, you know, after a good maybe 15 minute conversation, um, did agree to give her baby the vaccine. 
that day. And I really credit that to the fact that she trusted our office already. You know, the resident who saw her first was able to really build that rapport. Um, then together, we were able to just listen, you know, share credible information, talk about our own stories, talked about vaccinating my kids. Um, and, you know, my hope is that those touch points, whether it's in our offices or doctors getting on social media, whatever it takes to get the word out there, that that can hopefully outweigh the misinformation that families are getting through these sources. Did you resonate to her point about physicians taking care of kids today who have not seen these diseases that she opened with oh yeah uh, opened with that point very strong as a as a thing did that resonate for you absolutely you know i i also have not seen a patient with polio in person in the office right um and and even i trained at a time where we were admitting to the hospital over the winter and spring lots of children with rotavirus infection and now it's so rare, right? Because since then we have a rotavirus vaccine that works and that's safe. And it's just amazing, just even in my time in practice, the shifts that I've seen around some of these vaccine preventive, preventable illnesses. I do agree, as she said, though, that I think that's made um, us as a public a little bit complacent about some of these um, issues and seeing measles pop up and mumps pop up in places around the U.S. is just um, you know, it is mind boggling and that we we want this to be a linear shift that we're moving away and not seeing these ups and downs in different communities. So we definitely have our work cut out for us. Um, but I think that, you know, we've definitely gone really far. And I said, even just in my time in practice in terms of being able to prevent these illnesses through vaccines. Interesting. I also thought one of the points that Dr. Cohen sort of distinguished importantly that I'm I'm not sure. I always think of it so carefully, is just to distinguish between the normal questions that parents have about anything that happens to their child in a in a clinical setting is not mis and disinformation, mm -hmm. right? That's normal, appropriate, uh, in, in really wonderful parts of engaging in a clinical setting with their clinician, uh, and and but but. What she also talked about is that we need to do more about flooding the zone was her was the term that really I keyed into that that we need to prepare clinicians to be able to answer those appropriate and normal questions about what's happening for their child. But we also have to work on these things with sort of social media friendly messages, you know, all that other stuff to address this this thing that's different than normal parent questions. And so, Lisa, I'm wondering, how are you addressing that in the in the community? That sort of combating that flood, or or flooding it yourself, or or however you want to use that metaphor. Yeah. So we use every social media channel out there. I think that's kind of an important thing. I don't use all of them, so I'm kind of I'm not on TikTok, but I'm on Facebook. But we we use all of the social media channels to make sure that we are getting the message out and we're tailoring the message by platform. So, you know, we have more younger adults on TikTok. So making sure that our messages on TikTok are tailored for that audience, making sure we have the right languages so that we're, you know, putting things out in, in English and Spanish and Punjabi, making sure that, you know, anyone who's looking at any of our social media channel, channels is finding a message that relates to them. Um, and also not forgetting the good old traditional radio stations and newspapers. Um, we still use those good old fashioned um, ways to get education out there, especially in our rural communities where they, they still read the paper quite often. And so remembering that, you know, we talk about social media a lot, but we should be talking about all of our communication, all of our marketing and making sure they are appropriate for um, the groups we're reaching. Interesting. Flannery, do you wanna comment on that piece, that, that sort of miss and dis part that's different than the clinical part? Absolutely. I think that is a really important point. Um, as, we, as we talk about misinformation, I don't want parents to think that any question or anything that they've looked at online um, is um, kind of you know warping the reality. I think the, the point um, that I would make kind of the bottom line is that we welcome any question, even if it seems off or something that they saw just doesn't seem right. I would much rather have a family bring that up and we have a conversation about it um, than to um, not bring it up. Um, so we definitely will welcome all of those questions. 
Um, and to Lisa's point, I'll also say that I think that underscores the need to have the people who are impacted really at the table making those decisions. I mean, you don't want me to figure out what social media channel to post things on as, <laughs> a, I don't know if I'm a young Gen X or a geriatric <laughs> millennial, somewhere in that, I'm just not the one who keeps up with all of the trends in social media. But you know who does? Teenagers do, Gen Z does, younger millennials do. So ensuring that we're talking to youth and youth serving organizations as we're figuring out the best way to get this message across around vaccines, particularly to kids and adults, I think is really critical. Yeah, it's just right. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I also, uh, if, uh, in Dr. Cohn, when she was in North Carolina, learned a big lesson from COVID. And as CDC director, it seems like she's had an impactful impact, uh, it's had an impactful role uh, in thinking about CDC's response post COVID, reorganizing the website, for example, trying to think about messaging around that. I, as you reflect, reflected on COVID, I'm curious what are the lessons that you take away from uh, as as a as a program developer, as a as a thinker, as a as a clinician, uh, especially as, as it relates to vaccines, um, uh, what are what are your reflections? Uh, it seems like Dr. Cohen has big ones. I'm curious about yours, Lisa. Do you want to start? Sure. So I think you know, kind of my takeaway from COVID, and we got into drug service because of COVID. Um, we saw routine immunization rates declining in the state of Indiana, and and we weren't, you know, we weren't doing our education and our advocacy at, the, at that point. So we thought, how are we going to make an impact? And the best way to do that was to stop, you know, pick up some of the areas where providers and health departments who were highly focused on the COVID response, we could come in and focus on routine immunizations and help in maintaining them. And so I think, you know, we lost a lot of ground during the pandemic on routine immunizations. So how do we not do that if we have another pandemic? How do we remind parents to take their kids back after, you know, they've missed a year or two years of appointments and it's kind of fallen off the radar? I think that we we didn't do a great job of reminding parents to get back in for their well child visits. Um, and then I think, you know, the biggest thing we learned is to be flexible and to be nimble. And so I think any organization that worked during COVID you had to do both of those things. And so we have tried to continue that process of, of being flexible and, and maintaining, you know, easy access. And so I, I think there's a lot to be learned from COVID still. Thanks. Laura. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, one major lesson we learned was that public trust in the healthcare system is no longer guaranteed if it ever was. Um, and just as Lisa said, we have to be nimble and really be creative um, to build back that trust. You know, we talked earlier about the importance of those personal touch points um, with your healthcare provider. But I think that we also learned that this work, especially around building trust, also has to occur on a community level. Um, just as an example, during the pandemic at Children's National, we had teams who built up a COVID vaccine program that was drive through and walk up um, to make it easier for people to access um, and it was clear that part of the inequities that we were seeing in COVID rates were from uh, lack of access to care for sure, but also just lack of access to information. Uh, so we had community webinars about the COVID vaccine, how efficacious it was, how safe it was. We partnered with schools and with community organizations, just trying to disseminate that information. Um, so, you know, just kind of both the science and listening, truly listening to our local communities really needs to drive that decision in vaccine programs. I think that was really highlighted during the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, the, uh, the, the evolution of messaging and how to think about communications, I think was a real time mm -hmm. live exercise. You know, that what we know today is not what we know tomorrow and how to tell and how to communicate about that. It, it was a really different um, you know, year one was different than year two and, and how, to, how to be honest about that and, and, to, and to be able to have communications um, uh, methods that kept people with you as opposed to having people stop listening. I think that there were, those were hard lessons uh, in, in many ways. And, and, um, and I think the question about avian flu, for example, uh, as, as listening to how Dr. Cohen was framing that 
response. Here's what we know about how it goes from cow to cow and uh, from cow to people and from people to people and um, and who works with cows and then cow's milk and you know the the, the careful way in which uh, the, um, uh, the how that is transmitted is it, I think those, those kind that 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 is that is an interesting uh, example of messaging um, and so, uh, I, we have a lot to think about in terms of how we communicate to the populations that we're in charge of communicating to and, and how we do that very carefully. And I wonder, uh, as you all are thinking about the communities that you are in and, and, and communicating to, what lessons do you think that you learned and, and how prepared are we now, if it's avian flu or something else, um, uh, for the next round here? And what should we be holding close as we as we try to keep a hold of some infrastructure for what might be coming. Uh, Lon Ray, do you want to start that one? Sure, I think you were making a really great point that one of the biggest challenges it seemed like with communication during the pandemic was that piece of building the plane as we're flying it. You know, here's what we know now. And um, I think we tried to do a good job of really being clear and direct about um, you know, mass guidance or um, isolation and then, as we have you know, more um, science, then the message shifts a little bit. And I think it was hard, even for me as a physician and hard for the general public to know, okay, today what's different? Today, what do I need to know? And that's different from last week? Okay, so um, you know, how, what does that mean in terms of what I need to do differently? Um, and that's just how science works. I think we know that, right? We, um, we evolve in our messaging as the science tells us more. Um, but I do think that generally we could do a better job of explaining even just that piece of how decisions are being made. And, um, and just as Dr. Cohen said, here's what we know today. And that could change um, in being clear about that, um, that we can be both confident in what we're saying and also underscoring the fact that we're still learning and the message may change. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, organizations or um, other um, potential messengers, yeah, I mentioned the youth. I do think that um, we need to um, really incorporate them as, um, for me in pediatrics or the population that we care for, they are potentially future parents when I think about the, the kids of theirs that I, I'll be caring for. Um, at the very least, they've lived through the pandemic and they've seen the impacts, mental and physical, on themselves and on their peers. Um, and I also think about people who had the higher rates of mortality during the COVID pandemic, you know, those who are indigenous, Latinx, Black or African-American, um, and really thinking about the social drivers of health that um, were the root causes of those inequities um, and what some of the policy decisions are that we can um, try to implement to make sure that people have, you know, optimal health um, as individuals and as communities so that we're really ready for that next pandemic um, if that hits. Oh my gosh, we're running out of time. Uh, no, oh no, we have to get to some audience questions. Uh, uh, can we just go another hour? Can I just ask the <laughs> organizers? Is that am I allowed as the moderator just keep going? I don't. I'm not sure we're allowed. Uh, but this is fun. Uh, let's get to some questions. Um, uh, uh, one is about uh, COVID vaccine fatigue. Like, okay, how often is this? Is this the new flu? Uh, uh, how how many doses do we have to get? Uh, it, 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 how do we keep, how do we reframe COVID uh, vaccines? Um, uh, and is it is it similar to flu now? And how are you talking about COVID-19 uh, vaccines uh, to keep people um, from, how do you combat COVID-19 flu, COVID-19 vaccine uh, fatigue, I guess is the way to, to say that best. Lisa, do you have uh, strategies? Gosh, I think that's a really real problem. And and I wish I had an answer to whether it's gonna be like flu for sure. I think it kind of goes to Laundry's previous answer, which is we don't know, we don't know, and we're still learning. And, and so we tell people like right now, this is the recommendation. And as science continues to evolve, there may be new recommendations, but right now the recommendation is that you get your COVID vaccine and it's the new strain and comes out in August or September. And, and so I, I think we're leaning towards it being more like a flu annual um, vaccine. And I hope that that will then kind of 
get rid of some of that vaccine, that COVID, you know, vaccine fatigue that people will be like, okay, now I know I'm going to have to get it every year. I'm going to have to get it like I get my flu shot. I don't have to make an extra appointment to do it. Mm. And hopefully, and maybe a combination vaccine one of these days, that will make it easier. But I think, you know, continuing to be honest with people about, you know, what ACIP has said so far and what we're looking forward to. Lonry, do you want to? That. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think um, messaging it, it as hopefully um, it becomes part of the routine. Um, we know when to give the DTAP vaccine, when to give the flu vaccine, and you know, hoping that um, the COVID vaccine would be right in there with the schedule on a routine basis, so that it, there is less having to look up, you know, timing on on your own and figuring things out. So that that would be my hope as well. But I agree that um not sure that I can say for certain, um, but hoping that it goes in that direction. I think we have time for one more. This is uh, uh, too bad. Uh, so let's pretend you're the CDC director. Uh, what advice do you have uh, for uh, going forward? Uh, um, uh, how, what would what would you want from your partners uh, to uh, effectively vaccinate America's children and adolescents? Uh, so, uh, so, Lon Ray, let's start with you. You're the CDC director. What would you want to do and what would you need from us? Um, well, first, I to the actual CDC and state <laughs> health departments, I would first want to say thank you. Um, they have not had an easy job over the last several years. And as a pediatrician, I really do depend on their resources and the education that they provide. Um, as for advice, um, I, I would probably just sound like a broken record in saying this, but just continuing to ensure that everyone is at the table um, that should be when decisions are being made um, and that that table is diverse and includes the perspective of those who are most impacted. Um, you know, that work is definitely happening in places and I really appreciate um, that that is happening. Um, but I, I think that doing that from the beginning makes jobs much easier um, down the line when we get to the point of community messaging that we were certain to have included those perspectives early on. Yeah, absolutely right. Thank you. Lisa, last word to you. Oh, my. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And I think, you know, right people at the table, we need to start looking at some other, you know, um, professions like dentists, um, pharmacists as VFC providers. There's a lot of opportunity for us to engage other people in the field who, who can be great advocates. I mean, dentists, we see them every six months. It's a great touch point to at least, if they're not vaccinating, to, to give those reminders, making sure our OBGYNs, our specialists are all aware of all the recommendations so that they can help spread that message and, and that we have a consistent message that we're sharing. So I, I love the CDC messaging so that I can share it with our partners and we can all be saying the same thing because that's one way to, to build trust and kind of flood the zone, right, is to everyone have the same similar messages that, so we're not confusing people, so. Perfect. Um, they're not let it, since Anne just popped on, that means we can't go another hour. So I can, all I can do is thank you, uh, Dr. Lonray Falusi, Lisa Robertson. This has been great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Anne, let me turn it back over to you and uh, let me end with thanks to the PCC and of course to Dr. Mandy Cohen for being a part of this. Uh, Anne, I will toss you the mic. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, and that was truly a fabulous panel. I mean, I think we heard over and over again about the importance of the team working together um, to help children and families and yes, even adults, make sure that they get the vaccines that they need. And I think also um, Dr. Cohen lifted up how they are um, following the research about how to combat mistrust and distrust. And I think one of the major findings there, and we've learned this through our work with the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, is that uh, a local ambassador, someone you have a trusted relationship with, and that often is primary care, is the most effective way to combat mistrust and distrust. So primary care, we've got an incredible role to play in making sure that children, families, adults um, are properly vaccinated. This uh, webinar and the slides and the accompanying materials uh, will be on our website shortly. We're um, so thankful that you could join us this afternoon and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye now.